Shalom everyone, and here I am again, Rabbi Vincent P. Adams, Solokan Noah, and I'm co-founder of Etz Hayim, the Tree of Life, or Etz Hayim Temple and Energy Center, and I co-founded this uh, ministry with my lovely wife, Navia Leslie Adams, and we're coming to you with a recorded message today. We had hoped to it's Tuesday, we had hoped to uh, been live this past Sunday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time, but Friday evening, last Friday evening, we had a small fire in the kitchen, and so we had repairmen here all day Sunday. They came early and they stayed late, uh, did their repairs, replaced an element in the stove, and then they were trying to track down uh, the shortage in, in the wiring uh, here in you know here in the temple or you know of course you know we meet in my in our home right now I, so when I refer to the temple or the tabernacle know that it's here in my house at this time so they were trying to track down the short they couldn't find it you know like I said they came early and stayed late but were safe there was minimum damage done uh, virtually none. Uh, just needed to replace some elements on the electric stove that were malfunctioning and started a, a small fire there. So what we're doing is I'm re recording um, this past Sunday's teaching and then of course if you're watching this you know you're watching it either on Facebook or YouTube so that you don't miss um, you know the word and everything. Well, without further ado, we've had, we're in the, we're in uh, the biblical month of Adar 2, or 2 Adar, depending on your preference um, for the distinction there. And basically, Adar 2 is a carryover or a continuation of Adar 1. This is leap year, and in the biblical calendar, using the lunar cycles. We have a leap year. In our leap year, we have an extra month. And we call that extra month a dar two. We have, you know, the regular dar, and then immediately following is a dar two. So we uh, entered into a dar two uh, last Thursday evening at sundown, and Friday was a dar one. And here we are at Adar 5 today, I think that is, 3, yeah. We're Tuesday uh, in the Gagarian cal calendar and the fifth day of Adar 2, 5779. You know, if you're wondering, you know, what, what the date is, and it's the 12th of March, 2019. I think it's 8, 9, 10, yeah, the 12th of March, 2019, just to give you, uh, a, you know, points of reference whenever you may be watching, because sometimes people watch my teachings uh, years and years after I have, you know, recorded them. So here we go. <laughs> um, our rabbinical brothers are celebrating the parasha of Pekuda this week. Now, in last week's teaching. Uh, because it was the leap year, we did Pekuda and I believe Vayekel or Vayekel uh, together. And so we have already covered uh, Pekuda, but I'm going to take this time to uh, bring out a couple of other points that I, I believe I left out when we did the combined two parashahs. Um, during the month of Adar, you know, we started off with Teremah, uh, we've had Tesuve or Tesuva, we've had Katiza, uh, we have also had um, Vayakal or Vayako, and it ends with Pekuda. It's the, the last parasha. How many did I name there? Was that four or five? It was a total of, of, of five, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, Terima, Tesuve, Katiza, um, 
Vayekel, Vayekel, and Pekuda. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just want to sort of tie up any loose ends and, and spend maybe uh, 10 minutes or so with a couple of other major points of Pekuda, the last parasha of the book of Exodus or, Sh or the, uh, the book of Shemot. The entire, all five parashals during Adar have reference or referred to the erecting and construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness, the Mishkan in the wilderness, Moses' tabernacle. And one of the major themes that we have seen is uh, one has been uh, purity cleansing, purity, giving. Giving was a, a major um, aspect of all of these parashahs. You know, we had that common thread running through each parashah of giving and giving out of your free will. You know, God loves the cheerful giver. And then, of course, prayer. You know, you're erecting a tabernacle, it's, it's called a tent of meeting. And it's called the tent of meeting because that's where God would meet with the people at the tent of meeting. So prayer, giving, purity, and cleansing were the major themes that ran throughout all five um, Torah portions or parashahs. And now we come to the end with Pekudai, and we get a couple of new themes here at the end. Pekudai and Vayakal, Vayakal, they kind of begin to sum up the previous three or four parashahs. We kind of come to a finale. And Pekudai actually means to sum up or to give an accounting. And in this parashah, the Lord has commanded Moses to just give a sum total of everything. It, it talks a, quite a bit about the amounts of silver and gold that were used to construct the various components of the Mishkan. And it, it just, you know, lists everything that had been listed before, but kind of gives the, you know, the total. You know, that, that's, that's the, th the theme, uh, an accounting. And then toward the end, it says that all of these various components were, bought, were brought to Moses for him to erect the tabernacle. And as I told you throughout, you know, during this time, during the month of Adar, this is a month of preparation, a month of abundance, a month to get ready to go to war. This is, you're gonna be given provision. You're gonna be given what you need to go to war next month during Nisan. And so we have now an accounting, okay, it's almost as, as if God is saying, okay, I've given you this. I've commanded you to do this, that, and the other. And now he listed all. And when they brought all this, you know, the rabbis say that the reason why Moses gave an accounting was so no one could accuse him of stealing. But we also remember that, um, I forget exactly which parashah it was, but in one of the parashahs, um, Gosh, I lost my train of thought. Um, the rabbis uh, teach that, the sages teach that Moses did that. Oh, okay, I got it back, you know. And, and <laughs> so the people, the reason, you know, for Pekuda, one of the reasons is that so no one could accuse Moses of, you know, uh, stealing from the temple, you know, putting his thumb on the scale, so to speak. And in one of the parashahs, Moses actually had to command the people to stop giving. The giving was so great that they had more than enough to complete the Mishkan. 
or the tabernacle in the wilderness. So I don't know if I agree with the, you know, uh, the sages on that assessment of pay to die uh, or not. Because, if you know, if someone was going to steal, they would let, an, you know, an overflow uh, of abundance of materials come in so they could pocket more, you know. So I don't, I don't really agree with that. But the main thing or theme that I want to point out is that everything now, in Pekuda, everything has been, a, not a symbol, but construction. You know, all the embroidery all of the artwork, you know, the, you know, the tables, you know, covered with gold and the ark, everything is ready to be put together and put inside the Holy of Holies and inside the, uh, what's called a court of the priest and the court of the people out in the courtyard outside. Everything is now ready. And they brought all of these things to Moshe, Moses. And the Bible says he erected the temple or the Mishkan. And it's as if to say, okay, um, like I told you, we're supposed to be erecting a temple with inside of us. We're supposed to be getting our vessel ready for the presence of God to come and dwell in us. We're supposed to be becoming the tent of meeting ourselves. And the way to do that is, of course, as I, as I said, you know, through uh, sanctification, through cleansing this vessel, getting our thoughts, you know, if there was any actions that we were doing that are against God, you know, we should have, you know, endeavored to stop them during this month and, you know, enter into repentance and unforgiveness and pluck out any bitter roots because, you know, get negativity out of our lives so that we can be ready to receive the presence of God, his glory, his Shekinah. And we know from Scripture that God speaks to his people out of the glory cloud, out of the Shekinah. His word comes forth. And so when we prepare ourselves, when we become the Mishkan and the temple uh, in the wilderness, the tabernacle in the wilderness, we are now ready to be a proper vessel for the presence of of the Father and the Ruach HaKadosh. Now, they brought everything to Moses. And Moses, you know, the Bible says, Moses had to assemble everything. The, uh, the Levites and everyone else could not put it together. Moses was the one who had to do it. He was the only one holy enough or had the anointing to actually assemble all of the parts into one whole. And I liken that to, you know, our journey this past month. We have to construct or manufacture all of the spiritual components for purity, holiness, and sanctification. That was our job during this month. And if we fell short, we, you know, needed to repent and start over and begin the process. That's okay, because you remember during these parashahs, we had uh, the sin of the golden calf. I mean, what greater falling down or sin can you have other than that? And the sword of the Levites had to go through the camp, you know. Watch the, uh, the past uh, five teachings there, and you can read about that. Well, you can read about it, and also I taught on it. So we are to have, the, you know, to take the sword of the Levite and go through our own personal camp. Then, as we are now, we're ready 
to assemble all of these spiritual components into one whole. So now that we have done that and we've assembled all of the parts, we have become the Mishkan in the wilderness. The presence of Yahweh is now ready to inhabit us, to guide us, to lead us into battle, lead us into war, give us wisdom that we need to complete this earthly journey uh, that we're on. And after, it says that after Moses had erected everything, after he had put, it, he was the one who put everything in place. You have to put everything in place. And once you do that, once he did that, the Shekinah glory filled the tent of meeting. And it says that Moses could not go in because the presence of God was so heavy inside the Mishkan in the wilderness. So now we have assembled that. And it talks about the glory cloud how they were led by a pillar of a cloud by day and a pillar of a cloud of fire by night. There was fire in the cloud at night. Mm -hmm. And how our Israelite fathers would not move. If the glory cloud did not move, then they did not move. They followed the presence of God. They followed or were guided by the Ruach Kadesh. And so we have that happening now. The other thing about it, Pekudai, that's interesting, is that the Mishkan was erected by Moses on the first day of Nisan or Biv, or Viv, as whatever you know, title you want to give it in the second year after they left Egypt. So it was Rosh Kadesh, Nisan, where they had a holy convocation, a holy assemble that was, you know, done. Good morning, son. Okay. So this is further evidence that we're not supposed to work on Rosh Kadesh. Rosh Kadesh, which is the first day of every biblical month, we're not supposed to, um, to work. It's a Shabbat. And our rabbinical brothers don't honor this today. Nor do they honor the lunar Shabbat. So this is uh, concrete proof that, you know, they had a holy convocation. This is concrete proof that we're supposed to do this every Rosh Kadesh of every month. Because he, he instructed them during these parashahs to observe Shabbat. And so we have the temple being erected, or the Mishkan being the tent of meeting being erected on Nisan 1 uh, during um, Rosh Kadesh, the, you know, the, uh, the new moon. So, taking all of that into consideration and looking at those key elements, the glory cloud, Rosh Kadesh, the holy convocation, the observance, all of these things that had to be assembled before, you know, the presence could rest, rule, and abide in their lives and in our lives today. And I'm so happy that it is uh, leap year and that we have now an, an extra 29 days of preparation. So if you missed a few key points during a dark one, you now have the 29 days of a dark two to make up for it and to go back and tidy up things. 
because Nissan one is coming in less than 29 days in 24 and 24 more days is when we go to war that's when you know we're gonna hit the ground running in Nissan one we has we have as a tradition here at SIM the first since Nissan is the first month of the year whatever you do in Nissan will appear throughout the other 11 months it's the controller month it's the head of the months and so whatever you do the first 12 days of Nissan affects the next 12 months so we have always had our you know old church phrase the term had revival on Nissan one where we you know we would have a service each and every day during the first 12 days corresponding to the Rosh Kadesh's of the remaining uh, 11 months. We don't really have, we don't have time to do that this year with our schedule uh, in uh, Oriental Medicine School right now, but we're gonna do something. I haven't quite figured it all out yet, but that's why it's so wonderful to have this extra time in order to, uh, to do that. So I, want to end there uh, on the on the parishas and now I want to talk to you about another track that our Bible study is going to follow remember I told you we're going to have three tracks we're going to cover the parasha we're going to read the Bible in Hebrew from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22 that's going to take some time you know, I don't know how many years it will take us. It'll take as long as it takes. But we'll record all of the sessions so that you will be able to, over the years, if you continue with our ministry, you'll be able to go back and check this for your own Bible studies or use it in your own uh, personal Bible studies. So if you have a cell group that you want to meet and play one of my previous teachings, uh, you know, that's absolutely wonderful. Okay. Now, remember early on, I told you that the reason why I decided to conduct a Bible study that is so comprehensive, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, is, you know, I, I, um, I've never been a real big fan of Facebook. I always kind of said people who are on Facebook need a job, but social media it has taken over our society. And if you're going to be relevant today, you have to be on social media or have some kind of presence on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I don't even, I still don't know what Instagram is really. I'll get into it uh, sooner or later. Um, Twitter, you know, President Trump is bypassing, you know, the press corps and releases tweets where he has the control and nobody can edit what he's saying. That's a, a brilliant idea, you know, to do that. And nobody can, you know, spin, you know, or take anything he says out of context. You know, great idea. You know, whether you like Trump or not, that's, that's, uh, that's brilliant. So I've, I've got to pick up this social media thing somehow, okay? But like I said, I've never been a big fan of it. I kind of thought, you know, folks were kind of wasting their time, you know, being very frivolous with time, especially a lot of the things that you see on there. But since I've been getting into Facebook really for the past 30 days, now 30 to 60 days, I started looking at Facebook, asking questions, putting out a few posts here and there. And of course, uh, we post all of our teachings on our Facebook page, at IM Temple and Energy Center. And then on my personal, so-called personal Facebook page, uh, Vincent P. Adams, and on our YouTube channel under my name. We put all of our teachings uh, in those three places, uh, you know, and record it. And I was looking at Facebook posts and I, I get a post every day, every other day from an old friend of mine 
who used to be a, a very good brother, precious brother in the faith, who has lost his faith. And he's gone into uh, African religion, especially, I think he calls Kemetic studies out of Egypt. Just, and he's putting stuff out there. Uh, the Bible is false. It's nothing but plagiarism from, you know, other ancient, you know, cultures and everything. And just uh, demeaning the Christian faith completely on a regular basis. Won't mention his name if he's watching. He knows who he is. I still love him. Uh, you know, we used to do business together. We um, fellowship together at one time. And he was a powerful brother in the faith. In the faith. It wasn't like he was, you know, unlearned. So this is really uh, something um, that he's going through or gone through. I, he went through a divorce. I don't know if his wife left him because of his newfound beliefs or if his newfound beliefs are a result of that trauma in his life, you know, that he lost his faith. I mean, um, you know, he's, he's my age. I'm, I'll be 62 this year. He's either 62 or 61, 60 at the youngest. And he and his wife were childhood sweethearts. You know, they, they met back in junior high, high school, been together that long, and are, you know, have gone through a, a, a divorce now. So, and you know, it's a little bit irritating to see someone constantly put down your faith. And I even posted to him back and I said, you know, it's one thing to, you know, to lose your faith, but why are you trying to take so many other people with you? is what I don't understand. You know, if you believe this, that's fine. You can, you know, of course, anybody can post anything that they want. And if you have a certain belief or opinion, by all means, post it. But why do you have to put down what other people believe? You know, I try not to do that as much as possible, you know, um, but of course I do because this is the Word of God and the Word of God does not tolerate uh, certain ideologies and lifestyles, okay? But um, it is certainly not my intention to come on Facebook and put things on YouTube where I'm specifically just going after someone else's opinion or faith. I'm not saying that I haven't done that. I did a series on Islam uh, several years ago that you might want to look up on, uh, you know, on my YouTube channel. And, you know, of course, I had to um, maybe say some disparaging things about that uh, particular religion or whatever in view of what's going on with terrorism and, and ISIS and other things in the world. But usually, I'm just trying to get the Word of God out. That's my main uh, focus and goal. So I started um, this series, this Bible study. We really haven't gotten completely into it yet because I needed to lay a foundation. But I started this Bible series in order to prove that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God and that it's divinely inspired and that the first five books the books of Moses, as we call them, or the Pentateuch, were written by the finger of God. And Moses just recorded what God told him to write down. And I started off with a study on the Olive Top. Go back and, and watch that. The, it was the very first uh, Bible study that we did. I did a study on Adar, to start the month off and then I went into the first teaching in order to lay the foundation and I believe I prove uh, right then and there that the Bible has to it cannot be a conspiracy it cannot be mere plagiarism there are things especially uh, in Genesis chapter 1 that prove that this cannot be the invention of man and I went over 
uh, the Olive Tongue from Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, then Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 9 through 12, or 1 to 12, and then John chapter 1, you know, verse 1, verses 1 and 2, and then finally to Genesis 1, showing that this cannot be plagiarism. This cannot be a man-made conspiracy. And I laid out a biblical doctrine of the 10 Sephiro from Kabbalah and showed you the progression through the scriptures on Kabbalah and that that progression took uh, about 1400 years and if this was a device of man it would have had to have enlisted conspirators over a 1400 year period that's that's hard to do you know the odds of having a 1400 year old conspiracy completely trumped up and man-made over 1400 years and keep that continuity of that lie going is 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 you know the statistical odds are just absolutely phenomenal against such a thing uh, like that happening. And so I'm still laying the foundation. We haven't started on Genesis 1 just yet. And today I'm going to give you some more proof that the Bible is the Word of God. Because I'm going to, sh I, I already did it, but I'm going to show you even further today that the very first chapter of Genesis chapter 1 <coughs> cannot possibly be um, a conspiracy theory of sorts. One, because it includes knowledge that was not known at the time that it was written. We, you know, because of our scientific advancements and technology today, we know that these things exist. But back then, it was not, you know, man had no knowledge of the solar system. And the doctrine of the 10 C for Rome includes knowledge of the solar system that was not known until the 20th century or the latter part of the 19th century. So it can't possibly be a conspiracy theory because it illustrates that knowledge so completely. Um, Leslie, can I want you to put this yeah, on the 10 C for road? Let me walk over there. Yeah. Close the door here. Okay, zoom in a little, little more there, like, like we had it earlier. That was as close as you could get. I think we, we were zoomed in just a little more. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, you can, you know, not the best angle because it's glass here. So um, there is a little bit of um, glare there or whatever. Okay. At the top here, this is the Sephiroth Keter. And then over here, you see these circles and you can see them. This is Hakma, B9. Hesed, Gura, Tiferet, Nisak, Hod, Yisad, and at the very bottom, Melhood. This is the earth realm here. And as I've told you over the years, and I think even earlier this month, this is a representation of the universe, the solar system. Okay? It's a representation of you as well and it's a representation of the spirit world in one illustration we have a representation of our physical body we have a representation of the solar system that we live in and we have a representation of the spirit world as well 
This is our physical corporeal world and all of the other spheres, including this, I don't know if you can see this one here in the city because it's white. This is a pseudo Sephiroth. And let me just quickly go over the representation of us. Keter represents our skull. Hakma, our right brain. Bina, our left brain. Hesed, our right arm. Guvara, our left arm. Tiferet is our torso, our, uh, torso front and back. Nasak is our right leg. Had is our left leg. Yasad represents our reproductive organs. And Malhut is our feet. Now that's the representation of our physical body. Okay. Anybody can make that up, you might say. Okay. But where it becomes particularly interesting or dynamic is Tiferet in the solar system. As you can see, Tiferet is in the center here. Tiferet represents the sun. Now, remember, in ancient times, they thought the world was flat and that the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the planets revolved around the earth. Well, we know now that that's, of course, not true. The sun is the center of our solar system. And the earth and all of the planets revolve around, and the moon revolve around the sun. So Tiferet here, in the center, represents the sun. And traveling this way, okay, this is a planet. This is the planet, um, let's see, I, I can do this, uh, Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. This is the order, one two, three, and down here to the earth. Then the second planet from the sun is Venus. Okay? And what is the third planet from the sun? Is Earth, of course. So we have the sun, we have the first planet, which represents the planet Mercury. We have the second planet from the sun, which represents Venus, and Venus is the second planet. Then we have the earth, Malhut down here represents the earth third planet from the sun now you say well, hey you skip your side here in the middle your side represents the moon your side has a direct connection to the earth the moon is bound by the gravitational pull of the earth okay now going back in the other direction Okay, we have one, two, three, third planet from the sun. The four planets from the sun is called Jupiter. It's the largest planet in the solar system. And it corresponds to the spiritual attribute of mercy, Hesed. Jupiter is so huge that it blocks the earth or protects the earth from asteroids and space degree. So it's the, uh, the mercy planet. Okay, and it's the fourth planet from the sun. The fifth planet from the sun, Gurra or Judgment or War, is the planet Mars. Okay, then going up to the sixth planet, Saturn, with his rings, represented by Bina. Then, uh, what's it, four, five, six? The seventh planet is Uranus, represented by Hakma. And the final planet, Keter, with the crown, the planet Neptune. Now, this illustration here is found in the Bible. I already gave you the scripture references where if you can if you can read it, you know, get a Hebrew translation from, you know, instead of King James, read it in Hebrew, you'll see all of these elements that I mentioned there. Okay? What is so extraordinary and, uh, and miracle, miraculous, is that we have this illustration in complete order of the solar system. And man had no knowledge of this 
at the time that it was written. As a matter of fact, we did not know that there was a planet called Uranus and Neptune. My goodness, uh, you guys look that up on your own when those two planets were discovered. And then now, Da'at here, sometime, you know, I drew uh, Sister Leslie, when she did the art, drew Da'at with, in white with dotted lines around it instead of a solid circular line. That's because it's considered a pseudo c 4 Sometimes it's in the discussion and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we drop Keter and we pick up Da'at. Sometimes we include Keter and Da'at and we drop Mel Hook from the discussion. So we're always talking about only 10. Da'at represents the planet Pluto. And we have discovered in uh, recent decades the planet Pluto, we, we don't even classify it as a planet anymore. It's classified as a pseudo-planet. And here it is, it corresponds with the Ot being a pseudo Sephiroth. How interesting that the planet matches this, you know, the entire solar system matches this order. And it's all spelled out in Genesis chapter 1. All of this is illustrated in Genesis chapter 1. It cannot possibly be a conspiracy. No other ancient culture or religion has anything like this at all. This is unique to the Judeo-Christian um, tradition. As I just told you, Da'at is a pseudo plan, uh, Sephiroth, and Pluto, which it represents, is a pseudo planet. And sometimes we include Da'at in the discussion, and sometimes we don't. All of the planets revolve around the sun in concentric circles. Pluto is the only one that doesn't do that. Instead of revolving around the sun in a concentric circle, horizontally, horizontal to the plane, it revolves around the sun in an elliptical, perpendicular, and vertical to the plane. Sometimes it's in the same plane with its orbit. Sometimes it's below the plane. Sometimes it's above the plane. So sometimes it's there, and sometimes it isn't. This illustrates that. That is astounding, people. You may not get excited about that or whatever, but if you really consider what's going on, it's absolutely astounding. And it's all talked about in Genesis chapter 1. And that's going to be the foundation that I'm going to lay for you today, how this works in Genesis uh, chapter 1. Um, you might not be able to see can you zoom in some more, Leslie? I just on, on any aspect. Just there's I just want to show something. There's no ability. It's not. I cannot. You can't zoom in anymore. Okay. Well, between each of these spheres here, these circles, there's a pathway, and each pathway that is here corresponds to a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And there are 22 letters. So you have 22 pathways connecting the spears. And then you have the 10 spears themselves. So we call this the 32 paths of wisdom. The Sephiroth, the 10 Sephiroth, and the 22 letters that connect each one. And we have vertical connections. We have horizontal connections. Remember this now. We have horizontal connections, we have vertical connections, and we have angled connections, okay? And I'm going to show you some, uh, uh, another astounding fact about the connections of the letters, okay? Uh, when you do various meditations and say you're meditating on the attributes of Nesach, which means victory. 
Well, it's connected from Yasad to Nisan by the letter, Hebrew letter Nun. And so you, in under, to understand what's going on there, you have to know all of the attributes of the letter Nun, along with the attributes of Nisan, of Netzach, which has a divine name of God. I, tell you, I won't go into the divine names of God right now, but in order, you know, to get the wisdom, remember this 32 paths of wisdom, okay, you'd have to have that knowledge, which means you have to study the Bible, okay? Now, remember that, the three types of connections, horizontal, vertical, and angle, okay? I'm, I'm going to step back over here. back in in frame here I'll get to my scripture now in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 it says and I'm reading uh, Roth's the Aramaic English New Testament it's a direct translation from the original la language of the Aramaic uh, King James does a good job on these two scriptures I'm going to read to you but I'm going to read it directly in here because I don't, you know, I don't want you thinking that um, I'm making this up and I'm not using the original language, okay? But in these latter days, he has conversed with us by his son. Okay, who is he? The father, Yahweh. He has conversed with us by his son, whom he has constituted heir of all things, and by whom he made the worlds. Okay, not the world, but the worlds. King James uses the plural, and here in the, uh, the Aramaic English New Testament, Roth uses the worlds. And I've looked at the original manuscripts myself, and it's the worlds, okay? When I showed you the 10 Sefer Road over there, each one of those, spear, those 10 spheres represents a world or another dimension spiritual and physical I, you know just went through that with you and so Yeshua created the worlds now go to the 11th chapter of Hebrews and the third verse okay mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 for by faith we understand that the worlds pull again were shaped by the word of Elohim, and that things seen, okay, word of Elohim, and that things seen originated from those things that are not seen. Okay? Things seen in Malhut, in this, which is the earth realm, the physical, corporeal, you know, realm that we live in, everything that we see this gong behind me, this chair I'm sitting in, it was actually created by the unseen, by the spirit realm. You know, one thing I forgot to mention in talking about Pekudai, it was, you know, throughout the parishals and again in Pekudai, it says that Moses, you know, the people made the components of the tabernacle according to the instructions of Moses, according to the pattern that he saw on the mount. So that's where we get the doctrine um, as above, so below. He saw the tabernacle, the one made without hands, in the heavenly realms and God constructed him to construct the Mishkan in the same pattern exactly as he saw it. 
and it said he says that throughout the parishals and it says that they did it according to exactly how Moses told them to do it so as above so below as below so above amen that's where that doctrine comes from I saw something on Facebook last week is saying that's a pagan uh, concept. No, it's not. Okay? No, it's not. Things that are seen were made by things that are uns unseen. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 12, it says, all things were made by Yeshua, and all things consist of him. All things were made out of his essence. You know, out of him. You know, what did chapter 1, verse 2 say in Hebrews? It says, he made the worlds by Yeshua. That's how the worlds were made. By him, out of him, through him, in him, all of that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 12 says that too. That's not necessarily earth shattering. Okay? Uh, the writers of Hebrews could have, you know, uh, read that and made that up. But, well, not really, because they would have, well, they would have had knowledge of the Tennessee for Rome. The writers would have, you know, Rav Sheol, Sheol or Paul would have had that, that knowledge, and he's considered uh, there's some debate as to who wrote Hebrews, and a lot of scholars believe it was uh, Paul. But all of this uh, supports what I'm about to tell you about the ten sea for rope, about the things that we see being made of the things that are unseen, the worlds. And that's specific here, the worlds. And we believe that the worlds refer to the ten sea for rope. As I've illustrated, and, and it's, it's biblical. It's, I've already given those scriptures, can't go over them again. But Yeshua made the worlds. God made the worlds through Yeshua or out of Yeshua whatever term you want to you want to do okay the worlds and that things that do appear were made from things that do not appear and Colossians said that Yeshua made everything every it says that everything that's seen was made by him and everything that is unseen was made by him he made the spiritual realms the spiritual world as well as this physical world. It states that in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. Now, that's talking about creations, right? Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, and Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 is talking about creation. So it has to be referring to Genesis, right? Because that's the story of creation. Simple as that. So Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 and Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 are referencing Genesis. Okay, now we're going to let the rubber meet the road here. Okay, remember the Tennessee for row. Remember the 22 letters. 22 plus 10 is 32. The um, 32 paths of wisdom. There are 31 chapters in the book, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 1. It should be 32. I don't, I don't know why they delineated it only into uh, 31 chapters. doesn't make a difference. The original Torah scrolls had no chapters and verses. So whenever you read uh, the Bible, remember that. You know, the, you know, the chapter and verse is a, is a completely man-made um, invention completely okay the original Torah scrolls 
in the paleo and even in the later scripts had no chapter and verse whatsoever okay man-made maybe I, the book the books may be, you know, yeah, the books will be the only distinction, you know, the book of Isaiah, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, whatever. But the uh, chapter and verse is completely made up, all right? Now, here's what I wanted to tell you and illustrate to you about Genesis chapter. Genesis chapter 1 talks about the creation of the world. Okay, the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, uh, the animals, the plants, the fishes in the sea, and finally, uh, man and woman in Genesis chapter 1. So it's the story, it's the authorized version or the authorized biography of creation. A lot of people who are putting the Bible down are, you know, say that, oh, the story of creation, this culture had that same parallel story. Well, those are unauthorized biographies. Just because they were written first doesn't mean that they are accurate or true, just because they were first. So Genesis chapter 1 in the Bible is the authorized version of creation. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, the word Elohim, appears uh, a total of 32 times. It appear, when, it, when it appears by itself, appearing by itself as Elohim, it appears 22 times. And those 22 times represent a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Okay, you can't make this up. Remember, this doctrine of the 10th Seferot was, was laid out over a 1,400-year period. So it wasn't as if uh, some Moses or anyone else, because some people don't believe that Moses wrote, wrote it, neither Moses or anyone else wrote Genesis chapter 1 and then wrote the other things that support it. They were written by different people, you know, through the centuries, over a 1,400-year period, you know, from Isaiah coming on back, okay? Elohim appears, the word Elohim appears exact, by itself, appears exactly 22 times. And the sages teach that each time you see it, it represents a letter of the Hebrew Olive Bay. Now, I'll just read to you straight out of here. Okay. Okay, each, I'm reading from Tzuruf Basics, a Kabbalah meditation by Rabbi uh, Daniel A. Elias. Okay. So each, each time God's name, Elohim, appears anywhere, it is used to define some act of creation. You know, how were the worlds made or framed? By the word of God. What does a word consist of? It consists of letters. Hebrews 11.3. It was framed by the word or words or alphabet Hebrew of God. Okay? So it says here, each letter, I mean, each time Elohim, Elohim appears, it represents an act of creation in Genesis chapter 1, the creation story. The verses where God's name Elohim appears without the act of said, saw, or made represents one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew language. Okay? The next paragraph. When a verse uses the word said in Elohim, as in El and Elohim said, this additional condition represents a Sephiro. Elohim said 
appears exactly 10 times. So it actually is illustrating the creation of the worlds. Remember, the worlds were framed, the 10 C for O, by the word of God. Okay, read that again. When a verse uses the word said, as in Elohim said, this additional condition represents a C for row. Thus, there are 10 Elohim said statements depicting the 10 C for row. You can't make that up, okay? Note that in the first verse, God created heaven and the earth implies Elohim said. Okay? Now, it implies it because how did God, we know, uh, how did God uh, make the world? He spoke it into existence. We know that from Scripture. What does uh, Hebrews 11.3 says? The worlds were made or framed through the word of God. So through the word, it means he's, it, you know, he said, Elohim said. So it's implied, which gives us the 10 Elohim says, which correspond to the 10 C for real. Now, when a verse states Elohim made, this additional condition represents one of the three mother letters, Aleph, Mem, and Sheen. There are three horizontal, horizontal connections in that 10 C for row that I showed you, okay? The top one, which is what we call the Godhead, is Sheen. Sheen has, it's the initial of God. It has three spikes, okay? So, there you have it. Three and the Trinity, the Godhead. The middle one is Aleph, and the lower one is Mem, okay? Aleph, Mem, and Sheen, the three horizontal connections. Then there are the vertical connections. There are seven vertical connections, and they are represent, okay, uh, that's made, okay, let me get ahead of myself. When a verse that says, <coughs> Elohim saw this additional condition represents the seven double letters. Uh, those of you who don't know Hebrew, there are seven letters that if you put a dot in the inside of it, it just changes the sound. If you put a dot in any other letter, it doubles that letter. But in these letters, it only changes the sound. So they're called the seven doubles. And they are Beit, Gimel, Dalit, Kal, Pay, Raish, and Tom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they represent the vertical connections. All right? The remaining 12 letters represents the angled connections. Can't make this stuff up. Okay? We have 22 places where we see Elohim <coughs> representing those letters, okay? I'm going to move kind of quickly here because I'm running out of time. I've got maybe another 25 minutes. I, can, I think I can finish in that time, okay? In verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Remember, this is implied, Elohim said. It represents the Sephirah of Keter. Then we come down to verse 2, and we see the word Elohim. This represents the letter He. Now, how they decided which letter is represented, I haven't figured out yet. Then coming down to verse 3, and he said, remember, he said means it's a Sephirah, Hakma. Then coming down, we see Elohim by itself again. This represents the letter, or Elohim, and he saw. It represents Bait. One of the seven devils. In the same verse, we have uh, Elohim again, representing the letter Vav. Coming down to verse 4, and, and he called, all right, which is, uh, or is by itself, Zion. 
coming down to verse 5, and he said, be not. Remember he said, when you see he said, it represents a sephiro. All right? Then, coming down and said, and he made. Remember, he made means that um, one of the three mother letters is being used. Aleph. Coming over to verse 7, we have Elohim by itself, representing the letter Chet. Then we have verse 8, and, you know, he said, Hesed, which is a Sephiroth. Coming down to verse 9, we have Elohim by itself, representing the letter Tet. And in that same verse, we have He saw, which represents uh, the letter Gimel, which is um, one of the, um, let's see, they, give, one of the seven devlets, Gimel, He saw. Then coming down to verse 10, we have he said again, Elohim, and he said, representing the Sephirah, a guru, okay, one of the ten worlds, or spheres. Then, coming to verse 11, we have he saw, represents the letter Dalit. Then, coming down to verse 13, we have, and he said, representing the Sephirah. Remember, he said is a Sephirah, representing Tiferet. Coming further down uh, to verse 15, we have, and he made, representing the letter Mim. Then going uh, still in verse 16, we have Elohim, representing uh, the letter Yod. Verse 17, we have he saw, representing the letter Kof. And then in verse 19, we have he said again representing the Sephirah of Nasak. Then in verse 20, we have, and he saw, representing the letter Pe. All right? Then in verse 21, we have Elohim by itself, representing Nun. Nun. Then in verse 23, we have the Hebrew, we have he said, representing the Sephirah of Hod. All right? Coming down to verse 24, and he made, representing the letter uh, Sheen. Then we have, and he saw, representing Raish, which is one of the letter uh, that's in the seven doublet. Okay? And Sheen is one of the uh, three mother letters. So when you see, and he made, remember, that's one of the three mother letters. And when you see, he saw, that means is one of the um, seven devils, okay? Then we have, he said again, in verse 25, and that's Yassad, the, uh, the Sephiroth Yassad, okay? Then in verse 26, we have Elohim, Psamim, okay, by itself. In verse 27, we have Elohim again, Sadiq, Sadi. Okay? Then in the same uh, verse 27, we have, and he said, representing a Sephiroth. Remember, he said is a Sephiroth. Elohim by itself is a letter. Um, when it says, and he made is one of the three mothers. And when, it's, when I say he saw, it's going to be one of the seven devils. Okay? Uh, we left off at verse 27, where it said, he said, and that's Malhut, the last Sephiroth. Okay, coming down to verse 28, he said, okay, Kuf. That's a mi well, representing the letter Kuf. Okay, some misprint there. But we have Elohim with the, you know, title Kuf. All right, then in verse 29, we don't have any, and verse 30, he saw the letter, and that's the letter Tav, okay? So, if you want to follow me and go through and add all those up, I gave you, you'll, you'll see it comes out 
to 22 letters with the name Elohim. Elohim appears 22 times. And you'll see the phrase, um, I'll have to go back and just read it out again. You'll see, you'll see the phrase, he said, or Elohim said, you'll see that 10 times. You'll see the phrase, Elohim made, you'll see that three times. You'll see the phrase, Elohim saw, you'll see that uh, seven times. Seven and 10, and then the rest of the Elohims will be 12. It will be um, 12 times for the 22 letters. There is something I want to point out to you. I think this is a misprint in here because he says, and he said, and it represents cough. And we know that he said, this is in verse 29. Verse 29, verse 28. So double check that. Uh, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruit. Well, okay. Is that Kuf? It does say that. So we have one, it seems as though we have one exception, if this is correct. I'd have to uh, double check that. Um, we have an additional, and, and he said, which should be a, a C for O, but it's only a letter. So we may have one exception if that translation is accurate. And I have to double check that. But this is a, uh, this is not an obscure doctrine uh, in Kabbalah. Uh, you know, it's not one set says this or whatever. So I'll double check that. It, uh, the doctrine teaches that Elohim appears 22 times and represents a letter. And when it has the additional uh, condition of he said, that happens 10 times. And that refers to the 10 C for O. And that the condition of he made um, refers to the three mothers and the addition of Elohim's song refers to the seven devils. So here we have within Genesis chapter 1, the story of creation, we have the worlds being created. Now, I know I went through this real fast, but, you know, just play this over and over again. You know, check me out. You know, if you find discrepancies, let me know. And, you know, perhaps, you know, we can research them together. But this is a standard uh, traditional doctrine in Kabbalah referring to Genesis chapter 1. So, check these out. This proves that Genesis chapter 1, I mean, this hidden code, that's been there from the very beginning could not have existed as a conspiracy or plagiarism because it talks about the creation of the worlds and it illustrates the ten for rope which had not even been written about in scripture yet it illustrates the ten for rope And that had not been written about in Scripture. The doctrine of the ten for Road as laid out in Scripture, you know, occurred over a 1,400-year period. This, what I just read to you, was not defined yet, but was hidden in the text of Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 30 or, or 32. I think the last verse that had something uh, to that effect was verse 30. Okay? Or verse 31. Had not even, you know, plus the tendency for rope that perfectly illustrates our solar system, there was no knowledge of three of the planets. Three of the planets 
had not even been discovered yet. Their existence was unknown when Genesis chapter 1 was written. And I believe even for, yeah, and even for those first 1,400 years when it was being laid out. So from the very beginning, the Bible is unique. And I know some of you think Kabbalah is witchcraft. But Kabbalah proves the validity of Scripture. It is a biblical doctrine. Now, people misuse everything. I'm not saying there's not, not somebody out there uh, practicing Kabbalah and they've gotten into some witchcraft. There are people in the Pentecostal church who have gotten into what we call uh, Pentecostal witchcraft. There are always abuses. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. That's all I'm saying. Okay? But here we have it. In the first chapter of the Bible, we have proven that it cannot be a man-made invention or plagiarized. We've proven it. It illustrates scientific evidence that was not known for millennia later. Not just centuries later, but millennia later. Not just one millennia, but several millennia. A millennia is a thousand years. Scientific evidence illustrated perfectly in Genesis chapter 1. That was not known until millennia later. I doubt if, if Moses even knew what he was writing. What he When he was listening, when God was telling him what to write and giving him every letter to write, not just the word, he didn't let him paraphrase, gave him the exact letter and word to write. I don't know if Moses even knew what he was writing down. He certainly did not reveal it in any of his teachings, any of his written teachings, or in his oral teachings in the Talmud. Not known for millennia. Proves right there, and it's just one, that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And further, we're going to illustrate that time and time again because we're going to, by reading in the original language of Hebrew, we're going to go over the Aleph Ta phenomenon. Okay? So I have illustrated right there. If you, you know, this is, there's no entertainment value in what I went over. This is for the serious student. I don't do entertainment value. I don't jump and shout. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing wrong with dancing. I'm not putting down dancing. You know, spiritual dancing, as you see our rabbinical brothers doing, and uh, our brothers in Kabbalah, in the holiness, and Pentecostal churches. You know, Rabbi Nachman of Breslau said, when you dance for the Lord, you sanctify your arms, your legs, and your entire body. You're being blessed when you dance for the Lord. Okay? Not against it at all, but that's not what I'm doing here. Okay? I'm teaching you the pure word of God without opinion as much as possible. That's why we're going to look at the Hebrew. I'm going to end there. I want you to, you know, study this. <laughs> You know, see if you can prove me wrong. Rip me apart and let me know about it. I'd like to hear from you. You can uh, reach me at healerquestions at gmail.com. H-E-A-L-E-R-Q-U-E-S-T-I-O-N-S, -E -E plural. Healerquestions at gmail.com. You can reach me at area code 918-402-6206. Check out our YouTube page. Check out our FaceTube page. Face to, uh, uh, Facebook. Face to Facebook page, uh, Etsy Temple, 
or under Vince Adams on uh, YouTube and our website. Web page is etzimhealing.com. Etzimhealing.com. E T Z H A Y I M. Healing. H E A L I N G dot com. I don't know why I can never remember it. I don't go to the web page that much. But get in touch with me. Uh, study this out. This teaching and the first teaching I did at the beginning of the month proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And I haven't even gotten started yet. I just wanted to lay that foundation for you. That's just a foundation for us to get started on. We haven't even read Genesis chapter 1 yet. Or, or verse chapter 1, verse 1. We haven't gone into that one yet. So, may the blessings of our risen Lord be upon you. Shalom.